I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. This episode is a double bill featuring two interviewees speaking about two historical figures who led lives with many parallels although they were working almost two centuries apart. I considered having these as two standalone episodes, but the overlaps between these two figures are such that it made sense to broadcast them together. The first interview is with Terry Sayers Cooper, and we discuss the life and work of Marianne North. Marianne was a biologist and botanical artist who travelled across the world during the Victorian era, documenting the flora and fauna of the countries throughout which she travelled. Terry led a project to raise awareness of Marianne's life and work, and she worked with Kew Gardens and Marianne's family. The project was based out of Sacred Heart Primary School in Hastings and her story has become a regular part of the curriculum going forward, putting Marianne back into the consciousness of a new generation who live in the town where she grew up and who go to school and share the grounds of what used to be Marianne's home. Which is really important because many gardeners and those who are regular visitors to Kew Gardens haven't heard of Marianne despite the fact that she carried out important work during her life and also despite the fact that there's an entire building housing her work, located within Kew Gardens itself. Terry starts out talking about Marianne's early life. She was born in 1830, um, and she was born in Hastings. Now, there are a lot of people who live in Hastings and the surrounding areas who don't know that. Um, And in fact, I didn't know that until about three years ago when somebody suggested um, that I look her up because I might like to do a project about her. And um, I found out that she was born in Hastings. She lived on the old London Road. Um, Her father was an MP. In fact, he was the seven times elected Liberal MP for Hastings. Um, Her mother also came from a political family. um, And they actually lived in several different places as a result of that. They have a family home in Ruffham, which they still, which the the North family still owns. Um, And they had the home in Hastings where she was born. And they also had a home in London because obviously her father had to attend Parliament very often. So she lived between all of those different places. She was uh, largely self-educated. The family were quite bohemian in many ways, and they had an extraordinary group of friends. Um, And those were incredibly good connections. And for her later life, that was really important. But she didn't really go to school. She went to school for a little while up in Ruffham. Um, She didn't really like it at all. She was quite a headstrong character, Um, She had a very, very good relationship with her father. The family were quite close knit, um, but she was particularly fond of her father. And he called her Pop um, because she was called Little Miss Popular, which is lovely. She wasn't it's not that she wasn't fond of her mother. She just didn't like the role that her mother took um, and it put her off getting married as well. But, yes, she she had quite a happy childhood um, and certainly she started traveling a lot the family traveled a lot they traveled to europe in particular um in the younger years um and she also developed with her father a real passion for flowers and fauna um so she developed those really young as well Hmm. so what made her get interested in botanical art um i think she very often young ladies learn to paint anyway so um that's one of the things that she learned she did watercolors earlier on in life It was much later on that she came to oil paintings. But I think it was partly her father's passion for plants as well. So they had three greenhouses in Hastings in their gardens, which is really unusual, I think, for those times to have had that many greenhouses in a a house. Um, But that's where she developed that. But also her father was a really good friend of Sir William Hooker, who is the director of Kew. Mm-hmm. And when they stayed up in London, they went to visit Kew Gardens. And in fact, she was there when the Palm House opened the first time round, um, and the hot houses. Uh, so she visited those really often and she loved them. And she loved the fact that there were these plants all over the world. Um, and she really, really wanted to, to paint those as well. Um, so William Hooker gave her uh when she she must have been about 25 though when he gave her um a a bunch of amherstia nobilis which is a beautiful hanging plant 
and that was one of the things that kicked off her passion for wanting to really paint uh, plants from around the world. Hmm. So how did she take it to the level where she was actually doing it um, professionally, as it were, and, and where she was actually able to travel around the world to do it? Well, so uh, she was never professional. She never sold her paintings. Um, it was really much more of a passion for her. She learned how to paint with oils in 1867. Uh, she was taught by a gentleman called Robert ha uh, Hawker Dowling. He was actually an Australian colonial artist uh, who was born in England, but he was actually much, much better known for painting people than he was for painting flowers. But she was hooked by the whole painting in oils thing, which is, is really, really important because it's what meant that her paintings remained rather than being washed away um, over time. But the one thing that happened that was really sad but really important was when her father died. So when her mother had died, she, her mother had asked Marianne to look after her father. Now, that relationship between Marianne and her father was really close. And um, when he died, she just didn't know what to do with herself. She'd already determined that what she really wanted to do was to travel around the world um, and go and see uh, places in their homes as she called them so in their natural homes so that's what she wanted to do when her father died she inherited she inherited money because she'd never got married she didn't want to get married she considered it a terrible experiment <laughs> and I think that's because she saw what her mother's role was and she didn't want to be that person so she never got married it meant that she inherited money um, and the house in Hastings was broken up and divided up and that was the point at which she had the money. She was 39 years old. She was completely independent and she could do whatever she wanted to do. So when um, a friend of hers said, well, we're going back to America. Why don't you come with us? She saw that as a really good opportunity to go. So she did. She packed up and off she went. She still has a flat in London, but off she went to uh, off to America. So she did travel extensively. Um, and I don't suppose we can touch even the tip of the iceberg now, but can you just describe maybe some of the more um, adventurous places that she went to? Well, I think all of them were adventurous, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, just because of, of, of the way in which she travelled. She didn't really like travelling with people. She was quite, she had these connections. So in those days, you got around with what were called letters of introduction. Um, and because of the connections that she had, so for example, Edward Lear gave her a letter of introduction, diplomats, governors, lots of different people gave her letters of introduction. She was able to go to travel because of that. So she stayed with ambassadors, she stayed with governors, she stayed with all sorts of, of very well-known people. She met people like Longfellow. So she, she, she lived in those circles. However, she really liked to travel alone. And she did not like idle chit chat. She was somebody who really that she eschewed the badminton and the croquet set. Not her scene at all. She would not have been an it girl. So she went. To, she first went to Canada, and I think this is where she first went. Oh, there are these amazing places. But her first place that she went to that she was just completely overawed by was Jamaica. That was her first kind of like visit into the tropics, if you like. Um, and this was completely new to her. She was very good at making friends. She was highly respected. As she travelled and she got known more and more, people expected her to go and stay with them. However, she wasn't adverse to going and tramping through the jungles, uh, sleeping on the ground, uh, camping, all of those sorts of things as well. But Jamaica was really important to her. Um, and she both started and finished her travelling in Jamaica. Um, Borneo. She loved Borneo. She travelled over to what was called Sarawak, then I think is Malaysia now. Um, and she really enjoyed going to Borneo. She stayed with the Raja and the Rani in Sarawak and they helped her to go and see all of these different places. But I think just the, the, the fact that the ground is very different than the, the, the layout of the geography and everything is so very different. And of course, um, just different ways of traveling. Japan, she traveled by rickshaw and she was quite frightened by that. She was carried quite often and then she would often just get off and say, no, it's easier to walk. She got thrown from a horse. In Borneo, she um, 
she actually shopped the rapids. She wasn't against doing stuff. I mean, she went to Australia. She went to every single one of the continents except for the Antarctic. That's the only place that she didn't travel in her life. Um, I think it, it was perhaps that she had affection for places um, uh, rather than every place that she went was, was different. And they all threw up different challenges for various different reasons. So, like, for example, when she went to uh, Japan, she was given permission in Kyoto to go and and paint as much as she wanted to, providing she didn't graffiti on the temples or try to uh, turn people into Christians. Europeans weren't accepted there, but because of the, the high level of respect that she was held in, she was able to do things that other people couldn't do. And, of course, she had this absolute passion for flowers. Um, and she wanted to paint them where they were. She wanted people back in Kew, for example, to see what the places were like, where those plants really lived. And also to see things that they'd never seen before. So she painted breadfruit. She painted nutmeg. She painted um, she painted bananas. She painted um, coconut. She loved coconut. She loved the coco de mer, which is... Um, found, only found in very specific places. She went to places very specifically to paint those things that she wanted to see. So when she went to Chile, uh, she wanted to paint the monkey puzzle tree, and that's why she went. So yeah, it's and she went to the Seychelles. I actually get really jealous of all of these places. That she I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have discussed in the past how lovely it would be to get funding yeah. to re, you know oh. replicate her travels. <laughs> oh, it would be. I mean, I can't paint, but I can. T- I can use a camera. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it, it would be fabulous to actually replicate what she did. But I think, um, I think it would be very disappointing to see some of those places now. And I think that she would be really disappointed as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, she was already commenting on the fact that um, civilization in in inverted commas was starting to change the world by cutting down trees and clearing spaces. Um, One can't be sure, but one would imagine that even if she wasn't a a climate change revolutionary, she would be somebody who would be saying we need to save the trees. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, you know, and she would be using her her knowledge to help to help do that. Yeah, you do get a sense when she when she writes that um, kind of industrialization is is coming and she's already seen the the bad effects of it. But she also. I think, although she's in the same social class as the people that she stayed with, um, how did she actually view those? A lot of them were colonialists. Did she fit in with them? Um, I, no, this is really interesting. I, it, it depended on who it was. So she, she, I think she got on very well with people who were creative. So that's why, for example, with poets and and and, and artists and editors of newspapers, and uh, so what we would probably call the intelligentsia she got on very well with those people um i think i don't know that it's that she didn't get on with people i think it's just that she didn't like what they were doing necessarily she certainly as i said earlier she didn't like the badminton and croquet set she found them very um shallow i think is the word she liked to have good conversation and she enjoyed good conversation um and she was also an incredibly good singer as well so she quite often got invited to sing much to her embarrassment so I think it yeah it depended on on who those people were I think people who were just there and taking advantage um of the local surroundings and of local people she wasn't keen on Mm. that at all and she got on very well with the local people as well one very much has to remember it different times so if you read her recollections which are fantastic they give a really good idea of who she was what her personality was like um how she viewed things how excited she got about things how passionate she was about things um very witty i laugh out loud sometimes when i'm reading bits of them um then you you get a real idea of of who she was and what her life was really like but she does sometimes use language which these days we go like you can't say that because Mm. in those days that is the kind of language that was used and acceptable 
But uh, yeah, I think that she would definitely have been somebody who who hated, for example, the slave trade. Um, and yet she saw the results of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, because she does, uh, yeah, as you say, it is very much of its time, the book. Um, mm. And there are passages actually that are, are uncomfortable to read. Um, but also there are experiences where she actually prefers the company of the indigenous indigenous people or she yeah. will go to them for knowledge because she knows that they, yeah. they know so much more. So that's quite interesting as well. She yeah. really does, you know, she just kind of gets she just gets along with everyone if they're if they're of her weight on her wavelength and they're trying mm-hmm. to find her flowers and things she she doesn't care who they are socially she she kind of interacts and she communicates with those people so i think you're yeah. right it, it wasn't actually mm. so much about class it was more about whether they shared her common interest absolutely and i think a lot of people because they uh, certainly as her reputation grew um, people were so excited about what she was doing as well that they were there ready to help her as well and they wanted to help her so people would climb up cliffs and things to bring flowers down for her so that she could so that she could paint those um, and of course she did also um, discover some new plants as well um, it's not that she actually discovered the plants she just discovered them in terms of of, of, of western science so uh, they hadn't been noted before and Part of the reason for that is because she was prepared to go into these different places and, and she didn't care. She just went ever, wherever she needed to go. She wasn't frightened. She never seemed to be frightened either. Um, but because she painted them um, and she painted them in their natural surroundings, it meant that when those things, because she sent them back to Kew. Um, so when they were seen at Kew, they then discovered that these were plants that nobody had ever noted before so they they hadn't been brought to the attention of western science Mm. and what are those plants so there was the crinum northianum and and that was uh in sarawak so she painted that one it's beautiful white crinum that was named after her um there's a picture plant uh which was called the nepenthes northiana beautiful it's one of those hanging plants where the insects go up the side and then they fall inside and the plant eats the insect lovely <laughs> mm. i must say an interesting story about those actually because um i was talking to somebody who supplies wholesale house plants and they did actually tell me that at the baftas i think it must have been last year they served champagne in those they bought a load you're joking no and they served them to the guests in the champagne yeah <laughs> so imagine that <laughs> that's fascinating it is bonkers absolutely brilliant. oh wow <laughs> how the other half live eh? <laughs> yeah absolutely wow and that must have been expensive to get those in so. yeah as well. and and potentially toxic i mean i don't know wow. how safe they are to drink out of but well well actually no i think you can drink the water out of them if you're in the jungle and you're stuck for water. yeah i don't know but mm. give them a bit of a clean out maybe i don't know <laughs> chuck out the dead flies <laughs> that's fascinating <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, that I digress. That's right. What was the? the, what there, was the there, there are a couple more. There's the um, the giant Nipophia. It's it's uh, it's called the Nipophia northii, and it's like a red hot poker mm-hmm. plant. And that was in Grahamstown. So she painted that one, sent it back, and it's like, oh, that's a new new one. And then so all of those, those are the species that are named after her. And then when she went to the Seychelles, um, there's a capuchin tree there which not only was it a new species, but it's also, it was completely named after her. So it's the genus and the species. It's the Northia sexualana, um, and it's the only plant in that in that genus, and it's named after Marianne North. Let's just hope they don't map the DNA of it or whatever it is they do and, and decide that it falls into a different genus and have to rename it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'd be very cross. Yes, we very all cross be, a, be an outcry. <laughs> Well, so you said she didn't paint professionally. Obviously, she no. was contributing to in lots of different ways, but she wasn't uh-huh. doing it as a profession. Um, how was she viewed by her contemporaries? Was she respected for her work? Um, I, well, frankly, I think that, that there's a bit of a dichotomy there. There were people who didn't think she was a particularly good artist. Um, and and, and f- funnily enough, even now, recently, somebody has said to me, well, she wasn't really a botanist. And I think there's, there's truth. She wasn't qualified in, in either of those things. Um, and it, it was really it was her passion for both 
that made her if if for example if you look at the the paintings alone um they're not as good as the ones as uh, 15 years later for example because she was learning really she was learning on on the job as it were um there were people who really didn't think she was very good and others who were just astounded by what what she was doing so for example um when she first showed her paintings darwin asked to be introduced to her um and he said to her you must go to australia um, and she took that really as a kind of like a royal decree and off she went to Australia. But when you've got people like Darwin who are saying this work that you're doing is really, really important, um, then got to suggest that she was respected, highly respected. And people came from all over to see her, her exhibitions because nobody had seen anything like this. So unless you travelled, you hadn't seen these these plants at all let alone painted in their own natural environment. So I think it depended. So there were, there, there were artists who said she wasn't very good. There were botanists who said she wasn't a real botanist. And yet she married the two things. So she married the arts and the science to produce something that became really, really important. So did anyone think that she was taking artistic licence with her, with her art? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um Because it's, I mean, if you saw that, you'd go like that. Yeah. Even now, you you look at her work and you just go, that is so exotic. And some of it is is almost outlandish. And I wonder if she ever got questioned by people who kind of thought, well, well, that can't be real. That cannot possibly exist. So I haven't seen anything that suggests that at all. Um, whether anybody did say that to her, I don't know. Um I think people were absolutely astonished by what was on the other side of the world. Yeah, sure they were. Um, uh, but also because she was painting in oils as well, it meant that, the, the, I mean, the colours were almost hallucinatory. They were, you know, they're beautiful. I mean, the bright, bright reds and the bright blues. So maybe people did question it. But I think people more were, were astounded by what they were looking at than they were questioning what she was producing. Okay, so what happened to her? Obviously, you know, she she passed away. Um, well, actually, we could talk a bit about that because I think that in itself is quite interesting. You you sort of have to read between the lines a little bit um, about her death. Um, so yeah, she she retired, if you like. So she went. Her final trip was to Chile, and she came back via Jamaica, um, and she wanted to find somewhere special to live. Um, and she eventually ended up in a place called Orderly, which is in Gloucestershire. And she, she rented um, a house there. And what's really interesting was, of course, she was supposed to be resting by this stage. She she decided that she was going to make a very beautiful garden. And she did. She worked really hard. Um, she was quite deaf by this stage. She struggled with rheumatism. In fact, this is one of the, the reasons why there were certain places in the world she didn't go to. So she was going to go to Canton, but it was just too cold. And, and it, um, it affected her rheumatism so badly that she ended up not going there. So, yes, she was very deaf. Um, she struggled with diseases which undoubtedly were to do with her travelling. She doesn't really mention it in the recollections or at least not in a big way about anything that she may have had or that she may have caught but undoubtedly she will have had various different um, diseases one would imagine she would have had malaria for example because of the places that she went to um, and ultimately she developed a really nasty liver complaint or liver disease and it's that that, that killed her um, but this beautiful house that she lived in down in orderly. Yep, she developed a garden. And people sent her flowers from all over because they wanted her to plant them in that garden. So she worked really hard to then produce the garden. And even when she couldn't do it anymore, she was just not physically capable of doing it anymore, she still kept on people um, just to keep it going, to keep it maintained. Such was her passion for flowers. I think what is really interesting though is and let me just see if I can find a quote for you because it's it's very beautiful if I can bear with me so I'm just going to read you something from the recollections of a happy life 
and this is in 1886, and her writing about her place in Orderly. I have found the exact place I wished for, and already my garden is becoming famous among those who love plants, and I hope it may serve to keep my enemies, the so-called nerves, quiet for the few years which are left me to live. The recollections of my happy life will also be a help to my old age. No life is so charming as a country one in England, and no flowers are sweeter or more lovely than the primroses, cowslips, bluebells and violets, which grow in abundance all around here. So for me, that's just extraordinary. She's been to see all of these plants right across the world, and yet here she is just saying, but actually these little ones here are just as important as any anywhere else as well. I'm just going to talk a little tiny bit about the the so-called nerves as well. She did struggle, and it was actually it was much later on she started to struggle what what she called her nerves. And one wonders whether that might have been actually she was just running out of steam. Whether perhaps it was what it would be what we would call the equivalent of burnout these days. She travelled a lot. She painted a lot. She painted voraciously. She, I mean, the, in Q, there are 832 paintings and then there are more paintings above as well. So altogether, that's 848 paintings. Undoubtedly, she didn't show every single painting that she painted, um, but that was over about 15 years. She did all of those. So she just painted and painted and painted in extremely difficult conditions. She painted um, in in... Uh, oil paints and one weathers whether you know licking the end of a paintbrush that had oil in it might have also had an effect on her so there are all sorts of reasons why she may have had those nerves but they it did affect her quite badly and certainly um towards the end of her travels the nerves affected yeah. her yeah she was amazing um when she when she retired um and in fact after her death what happened to her paintings? So um, her paintings were already in Kew, in Kew Gardens. So she had um, arranged uh, a few years before she'd actually got in contact with Sir Joseph Hooker, who was the son of William Hooker, who was now the director of Kew, and said, please, can I have my painting there? Or at least she offered the paintings to Kew. Um, she paid for the gallery. She paid for it to be decorated. She went in and had every painting framed and put up, and she determined exactly where they were going to go. So if you go to the gallery at Kew, please do go to the gallery at Kew. Learn about her before you go, because then it will make the whole visit much more fascinating. And all of the paintings were put up in order of the places that she went to. So they are fascinating just to watch and see all of those different places that she visited. Um, those paintings are still there. All of them are still there. She, she, in her will, if you like, or in her will about her paintings, said that they were never to be moved and that they were to stay exactly where they, where they were. So those paintings can't be borrowed. They have to stay within queue. More recently, a few years ago, they did actually restore the entire gallery and the paintings as well. And they found out an awful lot of information about her, about the way that she painted, um, about how she managed to... So, for example, she'd go out and paint during the day. And, of course, um, sometimes she could only sketch. She couldn't get the whole painting done. But they found one painting that had her notes on the back uh, so that she could then paint it. So very often, for example, if it rained in the afternoon, she would sit and paint in the afternoon indoors with notes of of what she'd painted in the morning so she could get the colours right, correct. I wanted to ask you about the, well, two things about the gallery. One that I found fascinating. One is about the um, the species that are now extinct and the other one was about the serving of drinks. You've done your research well. So, yes, the... Uh, the um... Uh, the serving. Let's do the serving of drinks first. So she was very keen when she wrote to, to, to Sir Joseph Hooker. She was very keen that the place also become um, a resting place, so people could have a nice cup of tea and a cup of coffee or some cake, or whatever. Um, and in fact, she within 
the information that she wrote and she said it would be lovely if there was a little kitchen there where um somebody could just make you know, teas and coffees and people could just come and sit joseph hooker didn't want her to do that um i think partly because there might be have been a new cafe opening in Kew, but also he was of the mind that um people were there because they were having an intellectual experience not because that they needed to sit down and have a cup of tea so what Marianne did was uh, she kind of had the last say, really, because above to door archway, she's drawn, well, she's painted. One has got a coffee plant and the other has got a tea plant. And that was her last say on the matter. <laughs> and it's, it's lovely. It's wonderful. She had a very wry sense of humour. Um, and I think that proves two things. One, her sense of humour, but the other is the fact that she um, she liked to get her own way as well. <laughs> and I'm sure that because she liked to get her own way is the reason why she managed to do as much as she did as well. So, yeah, she had a certain inner strength about things like that. She also collected wood. She didn't only paint, but she collected things as well. And around the bottom of the gallery, there are various different um, species of wood. Um, and I think it's Borneo. I'm, I'm fairly certain it's, it's underneath Borneo. There are about 12 different species, of which two are named. The others are now extinct. Mm. They don't exist anymore, so they cannot be named. So uh, it, what she was doing literally was documenting a world that was disappearing. In fact, there's a fantastic quote, um, if I can read that to you. Um, and this was written by Sir Joseph Hooker. Um, in 1882 and it was the preface uh, to the official guide to the North Gallery and he wrote very many of the views are already disappearing or are doomed shortly to disappear before the axe and the forest fires the plough and the flock of the ever advancing settler or colonist such scenes can never be renewed by nature nor when once effaced can they be pictured to the mind's eye except by means of such records as this lady has presented to us. She, she was documenting a changing world. That's not why she was doing it, but she was doing it. Yeah, yeah, no. she was, yeah, as you say, almost inadvertently. Yeah, and that's why the, the fact that she chose to do it in oils was so important, because if she'd have done it in watercolours, they would have just faded away. And particularly where she was painting, because she was painting in the Yeah, topics. yeah, very true. Um, she's fascinating. Um, yes. I think that in some respects I may be Marianne reincarnated. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if people people should want to find out more about her, I'm sure they will. Oh. Where What are the best places to go to to find out? So um, but go to Q. Definitely go to Q. Look on the website um, about uh, the Q's website as well, because there's lots of information about her there. There are some fantastic books. Um, the ones that I would suggest, um, apart from her recollections, there are three volumes of her recollections, which are great. There's a kind of like a summary of those, which is in a book called A Vision of Eden which is The Life and Works of Marianne North, and that was produced by Q, uh, I think, in the 1980s. That's worth reading because it gives a very succinct idea of who she was. Um, there's a lovely book called Marianne North, A Very Intrepid Painter, which was written by Michelle Payne, um, again, with uh, uh, published by Q. And there's also uh, last year in uh, 2018, Q... Um, produced a book called Marianne North, the Q Collection, and it's the first time they'd ever produced a catalogue, if you like, of every single painting that's in the gallery. And it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. A um, couple of other suggestions would be to watch. Um, there is a film uh, which is called The Forgotten Queen, um, and it's a documentary. Again, it was made by Q, and um, it has Amelia Fox presenting in that. It talks a lot about Borneo, but that's really interesting to watch as well. And whilst I was doing my research and as part of um, my presentation on Marianne North, I read a fantastic piece of work by a woman called Catherine Hughes. I think this was written for The Telegraph, and it was in March 2009, 20th of March 2009. And you can find it online. And that's a fascinating read about who she was as well. So those are places just to dip into. 
um, definitely learn about her before you go to queue. It just makes the whole experience so much more interesting. And in fact, um, as part of the project that we did, we worked with children from the Sacred Heart Primary School in Hastings. And it sits within what used to be the grounds of Marianne North's home. Um, and we did an, uh, a week long project with the entire school. And then we worked with an after school club and we took 15 children up to queue. They already knew who Marianne North was. Um, and when they went into the gallery, that it was just astounding their reaction. They were like, wow. <laughs> they just, they loved it. And in fact, the education team were a little bit worried because they thought potentially the children knew more about Marianne North than they did. <laughs> but it was not quite true, but <laughs> they were a bit worried. I, I think it's it's for all age groups to get excited about it. They know enough about her. And in fact, I wrote a little story, um, and I believe that it is on the Marianne North website, Creative Force, which is the, the company that I work with that produced this project. Um, I wrote a story called The Story of an Adventurer for Children. Um and it's kind of like a, a summary of her life for in children format. It's worth having a little read of that mm. as well. And the Marianne North website that we produced is called, it's just mariannenorth.uk. So you can have a look there. The second part of the interview is with Tanya Latti, Associate Professor of Entomology at the University of Sydney. Tanya talks about Maria Sibylla Merian, a naturalist and scientific illustrator who was born in Germany in 1647. Tanya starts by talking about how she discovered Marianne's work. My background is I'm an entomologist, so I'm an insect scientist, and I'm particularly interested in studying the ecology of insects. And so ecology is the study of how um, organisms interact with one another and with the larger world. So Marianne's the person who started my field of insect ecology, really. Um, but strangely, you know, I never heard of her through all the entomology classes I took, even when I started teaching entomology. Her name really didn't come up, and it wasn't until I started teaching first-year biology. And one of the things I was trying to do in my first-year biology was expose students to the diversity of scientists, because it's easy to kind of get the idea that the only people who were doing science in the past were men. And then, you know, it would be a totally reasonable assumption, because there were all sorts of systematic barriers facing women who wanted to be scientists, and so you'd expect that there weren't that many um, and as I started to look, it was astonishing because there were heaps of women doing really good science at the time, um, people who were even recognized at their time. And for some reason, many of their names have faded away. Um, and I just found that, you know, A, depressing, and also really galling. And so something every, whenever I do lectures now, I try really hard to look for those examples of women who've made these contributions um, to scientists but maybe been forgotten. And so in the process of doing that, I stumbled across um, Maria Sibylla Murian. And I was, again, astonished that I, I hadn't heard of her before. Because what was her background? How did she get into entomology herself? Yeah, so she was the daughter of a painter, so somebody who was doing lots of painting and engraving. Um, and I think at the time, painting natural scenes was sort of a, a respectable profession for a, for a woman to be doing. And so she probably learned from her father the art of painting and, and all of this, but she seems to, from a very early age, have been really excited and interested in, in insects uh, in particular. So she would go around painting pictures of insects and, and selling those plates um, as a way of making money for her family. So that seems to be how she got into it, which, again, is astonishing because at the time there weren't, um, there wasn't even really a science of ecology. <laughs> you know, there was interest in the natural world, but there wasn't this idea that we should be studying how animals interact. And it seems that pretty early on she, she really twigged into that. Yes, in, and it was interesting. I read somewhere that she was actually making money so that she could be independently, um, you know, wealthy in her own right through doing science, which was really unusual at the time, wasn't it? Oh, it's extremely unusual. So, I mean, the, the social structures at the time really, a woman's job was to be the main person at home, have kids, look after your kids, and that, that was pretty much it. I mean, the idea of educating women wasn't even really there. This is the 1600s. I mean, women are still being burned as witches, you know, if they step out of line. So there, there was no no way for her to formally pursue her interest. But because she was the daughter of a painter, it was kind of, it was considered okay for women to be painting scenes and selling them. That was an okay profession for a woman to do. And so she seems to have used that as her, her way to sneak in all these studies of, of insects. But 
you know, as early as the age of 13, she started collecting caterpillars and she would raise them all the way up to adulthood uh, so she could paint all the different life stages. And one of the things I find really astonishing about Miriam is that in the 1600s, there was still a debate about whether caterpillars came, or butterflies came from caterpillars, at least in Europe. In other parts of the world, that would have been well established, particularly in places like China, where they'd been rearing silkworms for centuries. Uh, but in Europe, there was this debate. And so one of Miriam's big contributions is to document the entire life cycle of many different caterpillar species that she was able to say, look, Indeed, what happens is you get a caterpillar, caterpillar, or I'm saying an egg, egg catches the caterpillar, caterpillar turns into butterfly, butterfly lays egg, and the cycle starts again. And the only reason she was able to do that was because she must have been one of the most meticulous people, uh, because she had just hand rear these caterpillars and she would paint them um, by candlelight at all these different stages of their lives so that she could show that yeah, this is the life cycle. So how did her work, how was it received at the time? Yeah, well, I mean, it seems her work was actually pretty well recognized at the time. So her book on caterpillars seems to have done well. Um, we There are historical accounts of people like Linnaeus, who is famous for naming, um, developing the naming system we use for animals, and, and even Darwin sort of mentioning her work. So I think at the time her work was received quite well. It was a huge endeavor to have all of these paintings um, showing these entire life cycle from beginning to end. Uh, the other I mean, again, a kind of fantastic thing she did uh, is in her 50s, or early 50s, she decided that she wanted to go on a scientific expedition. And as far as we know, that is the first example of a scientific expedition in history where somebody set off with the explicit goal of doing something scientific, and that was it. Um, she went to Suriname, which was called Suriname at the time, uh, and she collected all of these tropical animals. She drew pictures of things like bird-eating tarantulas, all of these species of butterfly that had never been seen before. She drew uh, pictures of ants forming bridges out of their body, all of the, their bodies, which were army ants, uh, all of these amazing, fantastic drawings. And she did that basically by herself. It was her and her, her youngest daughter, who was 20 at the time, um, living in this totally foreign environment. Right? It's amazing to imagine a woman doing that in the 1600s. Just the journey alone must have been horrendous. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a huge two-month sea journey to get to Suriname um, from where she was living. It, you know, she was sick pretty much the entire time she was there. Uh, yeah, it would have been you know, incredibly difficult. And when she arrived, she was living in an area there that had been colonized by Dutch planters. And I think she had probably expected that the planters would help her collect specimens, but they had no time for her. They thought she was weird. They they thought she was this eccentric old woman. You know, why are you here? You're not contributing to growing sugarcane or any of the, the things that, you know, they were supposed to be there that, that these men thought she should be doing. And so what she did instead was to enlist help from the enslaved African population that lived there, as well as the enslaved indigenous peoples. Uh, and they would go out into the forest and bring her caterpillars, bring her plants for her to draw. Um, she had conversations with them, some pretty difficult conversations with them about the medicinal uses of plants, um, including some that were used by enslaved women to abort fetuses because they they told her that the horror of, of slavery was so great that they didn't want to have babies. They couldn't bring babies into that world. Uh, and so she's there in this midst. Um, getting information that nobody else had gotten before, you know, talking to people in a way that no one had really, or no one was really doing. Uh, and because of that, she was able to make these astonishing discoveries. Was it in Suriname that she contracted malaria? Yeah, yeah, it's thought that that's where she got malaria. I mean, it's always hard to know what people actually had from the accounts of their symptoms uh, because they didn't have the same names for diseases. I mean, malaria would have been a reasonably newish thing. Uh, no, sorry, not a new thing. Malaria would have been unfamiliar, I suspect, to Miriam coming from um, Holland, I assume. But, yeah, it's thought that she got quite ill there, and she was pretty much sick for the rest of her life after being in Suriname for those, those couple of years. She had a terrible end, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> she didn't die in the best way, but I'm not sure that many people at the time did. Really. <laughs> no, true. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> But I read that once she, she had a stroke towards the end of her life and then she became a pauper. Did you see that? No, I didn't. I hadn't come across that. I knew she'd gotten quite sick and had a stroke and, and was struggling towards the end. I know her daughter, her oldest daughter, uh, was still sending her specimens at that time so she could keep painting. But, 
you know, she she had been divorced by her husband years before. And again, at the time, there's not a lot of ways a woman on her own can make money. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's again, really sad and pretty unfortunate that that was the case. But in some ways, she was lucky in that she was able to have as independent a life as she did. Um, but she had to go, you know, just a pretty extreme length to do that. So she, at one point, she took her two daughters and she essentially walked out on her husband uh, and went to live in a religious community far away from them, or far away from her husband. Uh, and then after that, he eventually divorced her. And she said, that's it. <laughs> you know, I don't want nothing to do with you. So that would have left her alone, you know, pretty much in sole charge of these two children. Mm. That must have been so unusual at the time. Yeah, I often wonder what other people <laughs> must have thought of her at the time, living, you know, independently and doing everything she can to support her family without without a husband in the picture. Um, and at the same time, doing all this amazing scientific work, I suppose people would have perceived her more of an art, more um, as an artist at the time than as a scientist. But no, she's definitely a scientist. Mm. Yes, because she, I read that also she was, um, you know, collecting specimens and everything, um, which in and of itself must have been not the usual kind of activity for women. But she was also handling things and finding out maybe that caterpillars were poisonous because she was so hands on with things. Yeah. So at the time, the biggest biology was really focused on the idea of classifying and naming organisms. That was really the big push. So people would collect specimens or have other people collect specimens for them, preserve them, and then um, biologists at the time would just sort of draw and identify and name those specimens. And that was the real focus. Miriam was more interested in how specimens interacted. So she was drawing things like predators feeding on their prey. She was keeping meticulous records of which caterpillars were found on which plants um, so that she could say, oh, this caterpillar is a feeder of this thing. Um, and people just hadn't thought to really to really do that yet. Uh, drawing life cycles, those sorts of details were things that hadn't really been investigated uh, largely, at least in European science yet. Um, and, and she was really driving that. So in a way, she was the first, one of the first field ecologists in history, the first sort of person to be out there collecting specimens in the field, drawing them, looking at their life cycles, paying attention to who they were feeding on and what was feeding on them. Uh, and that was, that was unique in science at the time, um, but alone for a woman to be the person driving this. Yeah, I was listening to um, a lecture about her and the person who was giving the lecture said, I was trying to recall where I'd seen this layout. So you have the plant, you have the caterpillar and then you have the butterfly all in the same picture. Um, And she said, and then I realised it was in my Ladybird kids book when I was growing up. And (laughs) it's never changed. That kind of tableau has, has not changed since then. We still do that now. So, you know, her work does cross century and she obviously has still an influence even to this day so you know she she was doing amazing work um so what happened why did her work kind of slip under the radar why did she did she get discredited even to a degree yeah I I wondered that too and it, it seems that what happened at the time people you know they embraced her work and for a while she was celebrated um you know, probably not as much as she would have been as she'd been male, you know, and in the scientific establishment, but she still had, people were giving her credit. But at the time, the way you copied manuscripts was to hand paint them. So copies of her original books were hand painted by other artists. And, you know, Miriam was meticulous, but the people who copied her work typically were not. And so gradually small errors started to creep in. So people, for example, would change the colors of the butterflies to make them you know, more aesthetically pleasing. They would add steps to her life cycles to, to try to fit with what they imagined were happening. Um, at the moment, it didn't even exist or to creep in. As people took some artistic license and added all sorts of other things. And so the copies that people later on were looking at were not true to her original work. And so this sort of strain of, all, oh, you know, she's not really very good, started to creep in. Um, in the 1830s, there was a, very, a relatively famous naturalist called Lansdowne Gilding, um, and he wrote a terrible critique of Miriam's work, uh, basically saying that it was nonsense, and her work was careless, you know, it was vile and useless. Um, you know, there's a real strain of sexism here as well, because he said things like, oh, you know, any boy entomologist would have known this. You know, why did she write this? He was working off of a copy of her book that had heaps of errors. They were not her errors. They had creeped in afterwards. Um, 
And, you know, some of the other problems, I think, were that some of the things Miriam described sound so completely made up. Like she talks about this giant tarantula that eats birds. You know, she talked about ants making bridges with their bodies. Both of those things are actually true. <laughs> you know, there is a tarantula spider that occasionally eats birds. Uh, and there are army ants that routinely build bodies, bridges with their bodies. But those things sounded odd. And, and Lansdowne Gilding had never been to Suriname, so he just made the assumption that she was wrong. Um, he also did what I think are kind of almost clownishly <laughs> uh, hilarious experiments to try to discredit her. So at one point, he got a tarantula from a totally different place. It wasn't even from Suriname. And he poked a bird into the tarantula's burrow and said, oh, hey, look. The tarantula just ran away. It didn't eat the bird. So, therefore, whatever everything Miriam said is totally made up. <laughs> like, never mind. It's a totally different species, a different island, different context. Um, he seems to have been quite pleased with himself about discrediting um, Miriam's work. So, you know, that, that crept in as well. I think there was also a strong, a strong strain of, of racism in there as well, because people knew that she had been working with enslaved African and Amer- Amerindian peoples. And they said, well, these people are unreliable. You can't trust what they said about the medicinal value of this plant or the other thing. And so, you know, all of these started to come together. And then as you get later into the 1800s, um, science started to change. You know, in Miriam's day, people who were scientists were mostly wealthy, um, you know, gentle people who didn't really have to work for a living. And being an actualist was just something you kind of did um, either on the side or as your, you know, your fun project. It wasn't really... There was no education system, really. Um, there wasn't a so the idea that you had to have a particular degree from a particular university to be able to practice science. By the time the late in the 1830s wear on, we start to see the professionalization of science. Uh, and again, people start looking back at Miriam and saying, well, she was totally untrained. She never went to any school. She didn't go to university. She's essentially educated at home you know, why should we listen to what she said? And so the combination of all those things could have led to Miriam being essentially forgotten as a scientist. She still remembered, or she was still remembered as an artist. Her work still stood up as far as art went. But as a scientist, we, we kind of lost track of her. And it's only been really in the last few decades, last 30, 40 years, that people have started rediscovering um, Miriam's work. Um, and some of the, the cool things that have come out, like, for example, one of the plates she's has a picture of a moth, and that moth's tongue is forked, which is weird. Moths don't typically have forked tongues. And so that, again, had been used to this creditor by saying, well, this is ridiculous. No moth's tongue actually looks like this. But we now know that if you watch a moth just as it's emerging from its chrysalis, there's a very short period of time where that tongue is forked, and then those two pieces come together and fuse to form that single tongue. Um, and so she was right. You know, she was just being even more meticulous than the people who were criticizing her. Wow. Uh, she must have been just the most observant person. That The things that she actually noticed are incredible. Absolutely. And and just determined. I mean, I, I have never sat and watched the whole life cycle of a caterpillar over and over and over again because you'd have to watch it all the time. Sometimes they form pupa at night. Sometimes they emerge in the middle of the night. I mean, it takes an extraordinary amount of perseverance to do this again and again and again at a time where there were no electric lights. You know, you yeah. can't just put a camera on something and let it record, and then you watch the video in the morning. You can't sit there by, you know, by light. She was doing all this by candlelight. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, what prompted the resurgence, apart from obviously your interest? Was there um, was there any significant dates or anything that, that made people re-examine her work? I suspect part of it has to do with the fact that a lot of her, art, her original artwork um, – was essentially hidden away from public view for a very long time. And um, I suspect that once it started to come back into public view, people were able to look at her originals and, and start to see what she really had said in the first place rather than looking at these really degraded copies that had been handed down. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, the more you start reading about the history of like women and minorities in science, the more you start to realize that these people were there. They were doing science against incredible odds, you know, a whole system stacked against them, and they were still doing science. Um, and then they just get forgotten. You know, their names are almost erased from history. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty disheartening, yeah. honestly. I know. It's a product of the education system, though, I think, because for me, I kind of I try and seek out people 
particularly because I do I am interested in gardening I try and find people who have written about gardening who are not just really wealthy um white men and you can't even find it because even if you can find a woman she's still coming from a really privileged place but so it's really hard to actually get people who were, were sort of hands hands in the soil doing stuff but then of course I'm only looking at it from a kind of UK perspective if I go beyond that as you said in China they were breeding silkworms and so they were you know they knew they understood what the life cycle was and sometimes we just think oh god you know well this the way we do the things in the west just it's the only way of doing it and then of course there's a whole big wide world out there and <laughs> you suddenly realize how much you don't know well that's exactly it I was talking to someone about Miriam at one point I was like yeah you know she's the first person to make this connection between caterpillars and that was the person that called me out on and said look that can't possibly be true <laughs> because you know the Chinese have been breeding silkworms for you know centuries by this point they knew exactly what happened to, to get to a caterpillar and a butterfly but you know we, we forget that our our view of science and history is so you know Eurocentric that you know, and so male centric, and we we I think we also tend to have this idea that you know there's one or two people who are scientific superheroes, and they are the people that came up with an idea, and that's almost never the truth. <laughs> you know, there are almost always many many people involved in discovery, and then we sort of pick person to be the representative of that, and that person overwhelmingly ends up being a white man, and so you know the history of science ends up sounding like well. You know, there were no minority groups. There were no non-white people. There were no women, you know, really doing anything. And that that idea makes sense. We think, well, there's lots of oppression, so they couldn't have. But it's not really true. You know, there were people who were doing all of this stuff. And, you know, they were discredited or their names disappeared. Or we never, no one ever bothered recording their name because they were like all the Amerindians and the enslaved Africans that were helping the Orient, we don't know their names. We don't know anything about them, but they were the people that were doing the actual work of going into the forest and catching things for her and, you know, telling her their stories and their, their knowledge about plants and insects. And we don't have a single one of their names. It's fantastic that people like Terry and Tanya can go back and uncover the work of forgotten scientists like Marianne and Maria. But as Tanya says, many who were instrumental to their productivity have been lost to time. In this age of technology, we are all journalists and publishers, and the recorded voice and the filmed subject are increasingly valid forms of documentation. As well as speaking to well-known and well-loved people from the field of horticulture, I'm trying to uncover voices and stories that might otherwise go unheard and send them out far and wide. So if you want to help me do that, please share the podcast with other people who you feel might enjoy it. But I can only reach those people who speak English and have a phone or internet connectivity, So the other thing you can do is start your own podcast. And I I do mean that. Record voices, particularly those who might not get a platform otherwise. And record in your own language and about your own region so we can build a library of resources. And as Marianne North did, document a world that is rapidly changing. Thank you to Terry and Tanya and to you for listening. And I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter, which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work. Because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.